August 2024. We adopt and reiterate all the contents of the three sets of documents. Yes. Allow me therefore to go to the issue whether the respondent is properly joined to these proceedings. We submit that the respondent is properly joined to these proceedings and that by rules, being the Mutunga rules, nothing turns on that question anyway. Nothing turns on that question anyway. To make the argument that the respondent is properly joined to these proceedings, I can do no better than to refer this court to a court of appeal authority, which is binding on this court. That's the case of the Speaker of the National Assembly. Let's just begin by looking at the party to that case. The Speaker of the National Assembly, filing a case in his own name, versus the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness, 2019 EKLR. <coughs> I must apologize that we didn't paginate our bundle of authorities. Uh, I, I, I apologize for that. Paginate, I appreciate it. And then return them to Thank you so much. So if you the last bundle, the last authority in that bundle is that case I've referred to, the Speaker of the National Assembly versus the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness. I begin by making an argument that that appeal was filed in the name of the Speaker of the National Assembly as the appellant. Yes. Number two, the fourth respondent in that appeal was the Speaker of the Senate. Yes. So I make a simple argument that the Speakers of both Houses of Parliament cannot begin by acknowledging their juristic personality and their capacity to sue and be sued in their own names when they are filing cases and protest that capacity when they are sued. The law frowns upon those who approbate and reprobate at the same time. Yes. Secondly, I will beseech this court to look at paragraphs 52 all the way to paragraph 64 of that decision of the Court of Appeal. Yes. And you'll discover the following principles. At paragraph 52, the court acknowledged a prior judgment of the High Court in Judicial Service Commission versus the Speaker of the National Assembly. In which case, the High Court has had upheld the position that the Speaker of the National Assembly was a proper party to be sued where actions of the National Assembly were in issue. Equally, yes. the court in this judgment I've referred you to, the Speaker of the National Assembly versus the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness, found that the speakers of the National Assembly and the Senate <coughs> were proper parties in a suit where a person was challenging the constitutionality of actions taken by a the House of Parliament. Yes. Finally, the court acknowledged that pursuant to Rule 5 of the Mutunga Rules of 2013, yes. 
non-joinder or misjoinder of parties could not defeat a constitutional petition. My Lord, I wish to close by saying this. Since the Speaker of the Senate was a party to this decision of the Court of Appeal, I beseech this court in its ruling to censor him for bringing this objection, knowing that the judiciary has given him prior guidance on this question. It is improper use of judicial time to invite us to respond to this kind of objection. Allow me to then invite my learned colleague, Mr. Elias Mutuma, to now proceed and do duty on the more substantive aspects of the applications before you. Thank you, my lord. <clears throat> you will note that the notice of motion for discharging the conservatory orders is premised on that one ground that we have sued the wrong party. My learned senior having dispensed with that issue, that notice of motion, my lord, lacks merit and ought to be dispensed with. Dismissed. Yes. My Lord, the principles that guides a court that sits to consider an application for conservatory orders, such as the one before you, have been established by our courts. Yes. All we need to demonstrate on behalf of the applicant is that she has a prima facie case with a likelihood of success. Yes. My Lord, secondly, the applicant is supposed to demonstrate that in the absence of conservatory orders, she is likely to suffer prejudice irreparably. Yes. Thirdly, my Lord, is that either the grant or denial of the conservatory orders as a relief is going to enhance constitutional values and objects on a specific right as guaranteed by the Constitution in the Bill of Rights. Yes. Fourth is whether if conservatory orders are not granted, the petition is likely to be rendered negatory And last to my lord is where does the public interest lie in respect of the matter? Yes. Prima facie case, my lord, has been defined to mean that on the value, on the face value, the petitioner or the applicant has an arguable case. Not one that will succeed but one that has the likelihood of succeeding on the value of it, on the first value of it rather. Yes. As such, my Lord, we do not need to go into the merits of the case. We do not need to converse the evidence. We do not want to bring witnesses at this juncture. All we need to show, my Lord, is that there is one bit of likelihood of this matter succeeding. It is our submissions, my Lord, that not only do we have a prima facie case, we have one that has overwhelming chances of success. Yes. We have filed an affidavit in court. We have produced documentary evidence We have tabled other material that demonstrates how strong the petitioner's case is. Therefore, my Lord, what the court needs to certify itself is whether there is a course of action yes. that it is being invited to interrogate 
and offer a relief on. A course of action, my lord, is defined as where a party approaching the court claims that they have a specific right. Yes. There is an allegation that that right has been violated. There is an accusation that the respondent or the defendant is responsible for the violation and as a result the applicant has suffered or is likely to suffer loss. So then what is the Briefly then, my lord, without going into so much details of what the petitioner's case is about, we are here because the petitioner has been impeached through the exercise of a constitutional mandate by the respondent yes. in a process anchored under Article 181 of the Constitution as operationalized by Section 33 of the County Governments Act. Section? 33 of the County Governments Act, my lord. Yes. That having taken place, my lord, gives you jurisdiction under Article 165, specifically 165, 3B, and D, yes. that gives you the powers to determine whether a question relating to violation of a constitutional right <coughs> or whether that right under the Bill of Rights has been denied, violated, or infringed. Yes. And under D, whether anything said to have been done under the powers of this constitution was done in accordance with the constitution. Yes. Senate exercised its powers under those provisions of the law and our client feels aggrieved. Our client feels that her rights were violated for the following reasons. One is that the impeachment proceedings proceeded in clear defiance of court orders. Yes. When you look at paragraph five of the affidavit sworn by Her Excellency the Governor, At an extra KM03, yes. she has produced a copy of the court's ruling and an order that prohibited the County Assembly of Meru and by extension the Senate from proceeding with the impeachment of the governor. It has been argued, my lord, and it will be argued that that order did not apply to the specific motion of <coughs> impeachment. Yes. And capable of looking at that order and ruling and form an opinion specific to any motion or it was touching on the impeachment process as a whole. What is the... The petitioner's position, my lord, is that the Honorable Judge, Honorable Kassan, was very clear in his mind that what he was prohibiting was the impeachment process by whatever name, by whatever format. At any stage, to allow him the various issues that had been raised in the petition. He did 
did and what the Senate failed to appreciate is the mischief that the court wanted to prevent. Yes. We submit that the proceedings at the Senate as forwarded from the County Assembly of Meru were a nullity for being in contravention of a very clear court order. Yes. Secondly, my Lord, is that the petitioner has approached you and required you to exercise your powers under Article 165 yes. D <coughs> that gives you the powers to interpret any provision of the law and make a determination whether it is in contravention of the Constitution. Yes. My Lord, we will be urging you when you'll be sitting to hear the main petition yes. to consider the clearing section 33 or of the County Government Act as being unconstitution for being in violation of Article 50 yes. 2 O of the Constitution. Why will we be asking that, my Lord? For one simple reason. The Constitution is the grand norm. All other norms derive their validity from the grand norm. Yes. So Section 33 ought to be in tandem consistent with Article 52 of the Constitution. And that specific article, my Lord, is very express that no person have been previously tried off and either discharged or convicted of. My Lord, and the material before you we are able to demonstrate that the governor of Meru County last year was dragged before a similar process. Charges were labeled against her. The Senate found that those allegations had not been substantiated. She was acquitted. Yes. In the impugned notice of motion for impeachment, that is before you today, yes. similar charges were brought against her verbatim. Yes. Senate failed to appreciate that bringing similar charges as those that were brought before them last year by in contravention of Article 52 of the Constitution. Now, my Lord, without then giving conservatory orders to give you time to be able to interrogate that section, how will justice be served? That in itself is a prima Actually, more than prima facie case, my Lord. Yes, thank you, my Lord. I will move on to the next issue. Thirdly, my Lord, is that again a clear reading of Article 51 of the Constitution is that every accused person has a right to have a dispute resolved by application of the law yes. by an independent and impartial tribunal. I'm talking about the right to fair hearing, my Lord. It is our submission that yes. the proceedings at the Senate violated the petition as right to fair hearing in that the Senate was not impartial, in that the environment was not conducive for fair hearing, 
that the decision of the Senate was predetermined and therefore there could not have been justice by Senate which was acted, was supposed to be a neutral arbiter to judicial powers. <coughs> At paragraph 37 to that 45 of the supplementary affidavit, the court will come across serious allegations of misconduct, violence, mayhem at the, count, at the Senate, my Lord, making it impossible for the petitioner to present her case and plead <coughs> for justice before Senate. It is only fair, my Lord, that this court is given an opportunity to interrogate what transpired and whether the same could have afforded the petitioner a fair hearing. As before a determination is made. Well, on that issue, my Lord, you will notice by looking at paragraph 10 of the affidavit that we have annexed the Gazette notice from the supporting affidavit? Yes, my lord, of the supporting affidavit. Yes. And further paragraph 26 of the supplementary affidavit. Yes. I'm talking about annex just KM05 of the supporting affidavit and BKM5 of the supplementary affidavit, my lord, you will come across two communications. One is a Gazette notice from Senate yes. that communicates a decision to impeach the governor before the governor was impeached, before the vote to impeach her. Just a moment, I'll pause the time. Thank you, my lord. Uh, KM5? KM5? Yes, I'm there. Yes, we have annexed the Gazette notice. Yes. And then BKM5 of the supplementary yes. at paragraph 26, we have annexed the communication from Senate to the Speaker of County Assembly of Meru. Both communications, my lord, are dated 20th of August 2024. Both are dated? 20th of August 2024. Yes. It is not in dispute that Senate only voted, was able to vote for the impeachment on 21st of August 2024. Yes. It is very clear then, my lord, in anyone's mind that those gazettes, that gazette notice and the communication was prepared before the outcome of the Senate's uh, voting. That can only confirm that Whatever we were doing at the Senate was predetermined, a sham and mockery of the process. Yes. On that basis, my Lord, then, we urge you to consider giving conservatory orders to be able to allow yourself to look at those issues. Well, I think I have very few minutes, my Lord. You have five minutes. Thank you. Then what is the prejudice? of not granting conservatory orders, my lord. Yes. 
My Lord, if conservatory orders are not granted or confirmed, it means that the provisions of Article 181 kicks in, in that the Deputy Governor of Mary County is sworn in yes. as the substantive governor of Meru County. capable of discharging and exercising all the mandates, powers, and privileges that comes with the position of a governor. He could fire all the CECs. He could rearrange the government. He could disrupt service delivery. So if then the court was to later find that indeed this impeachment was a sham, yes. there would be no way of rectifying that situation because we will have to go through a new process of now removing that governor. And I do not think there is any mechanism in law to do that. I've posed you your time so that you can ask this question. Does the High Court have the power, if the petition was to be successful, to nullify the appointment of a governor who came in under Article 181, put the petitioner back in office, and address these eventualities that you outlined? Well, that's quite debatable, because the only way... Hold on, I have to write. Yes, proceed. There is only one known procedure of removing a governor from office. However, that, however, process that, whatever process that brought the governor to office, by going back to Article 181 and Section 33 of the County Government Act. Yes. So the High Court has not been granted very express powers to remove one governor and replace with another. Yes. And even if it had, my lord, and we are arguing it doesn't, what about all the other actions taken by this governor? Is the court capable of also offering a remedy to that, to those actions? That's why the court must look at the balance of convenience. Where does it lie? Is it having the governor who is in place continuing to serve with minimal disruption? And if later then the petition is found to be unmerited, pronounce itself, and then allow the deputy to take over? Your, your time is back on. Yes. I submit, my lord, that the balance of convenience tilts in favor of the petition in this case. The inconvenience, the prejudice is too much, too much, not just to the petitioner, but to the people of Meru. Yes. And Maru, we are not asking you to install a new governor in place. We are asking you to allow the situation to remain as it is. I submit that it is actually in public good and public interest for the governor to be allowed to continue serving, offering services until such a time when the court pronounces itself on the question at hand. My Lord, I believe that I have covered most of the areas. Yes. I reserve the rest for our rejoinder. You um, have two minutes to go, so I'll add that two minutes. Yes. So you rejoin the one. Just to the court. Mr. Makere, a little louder, please. Yes.